Okay, right, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just jump into it. So, sure. what made you want to become an actor? I think it's a really, it's actually, it's a much more kind of interesting question than I think it gets given credit for, because I think on the one hand, you kind of w- want to do it, because I think you want to do it because you get praised for it, to be honest, initially. Mm-hmm. I think you want to do it because, you know, you, at five or whatever I was when I started going to little Saturday morning drama classes and stuff, and people tell you you're good at it. And I think when you're a kid, that's really, really addictive, like being praised for doing something. And it was something that I took to quite naturally and that I enjoyed the creative side of it. And I enjoyed the social side of it. Like you just make really, really good friends when you're doing stuff like that. And then from the age of about 14, 15, it became what I definitely wanted to do. Um, And it was kind of my only point of focus really from that point on. Uh, and I started working at about 17. So pretty soon after I kind of decided I really wanted to do it, I, I kind of managed to force my way into it. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it is, it's, it's a really selfish thing to do. It's a massively selfish thing to do to be an actor. You don't do it for other people. Like, and I think unless you come from like, unless you come from a background or like, a, maybe like a, a background or a demographic that sees themselves underrepresented in the media and they're like I want to change those stories I want to change the yeah. kind of story people tell about me I'm a middle class white kid from south of England I'm a, and I'm a man there was no one was doing yeah. me any dissent. like no one I, I my community didn't need me I just wanted mm. to do it do you know what I mean it was it was for me it was for yeah me, really. yeah well I mean if you enjoyed it it's good that you pursued yeah it. oh god yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and I loved it I loved it yeah um so while you were kind of on that journey becoming an actor did you have like any inspirations like many actors that you kind of looked up to like i want to be that person yeah i mean the 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 big well the person who i kind of initially really really who i kind of really first got into when when i was um well when i was i was much younger weirdly i used to watch um a tv show called sharp and sharp was a kind of tv show from like the 80s and 90s and it was this it was the thing that made sean bean a star um, oh. And the books were written by Bernard Cornwell, who wrote the books of The Last Kingdom. So it was like oh, a really right. weird symmetry that like the person yeah. who kind of gone, oh, wow, that's amazing. I ended up being in the next thing that was adapted from his from Tilly, uh, for telly. But um, I loved like, I loved like Lord of the Rings. I loved Viggo Mortensen in Lord of the, in playing Aragorn in Lord of the Rings. Uh, and then when I got a little bit older, it was actors like, but it was particularly it was Stephen Graham, the actor Stephen Graham, whose line of duty, um, like he's for me, it was This Is England is the thing that I kind of became really aware of him in. Um, and he's a, like a five foot four little guy who plays the most terrifying, interesting, kind of really complicated characters. Um, and I found that really personally inspiring to to look at someone who was not defined by his stature. Because I think, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm only five foot five. And so I accepted really early on that I never looked like a romantic lead. I was never gonna do that. Mm. And I was given this bit of advice by, by a much older actor when I was 19, who said, don't worry about trying to do absolutely everything. Don't worry about being a chameleon and like shape some shapeshifter who can do the lot. Just figure out what you do and get to a point where you're the person people want when they want that kind of thing. Um, I think Stephen, watching Stephen Graham's work really made me feel like, oh, you can, you can, to an extent, you can define what that is. Um, I think he's unbelievable. I think Philip Seymour Hoffman is an unbelievable, was sadly an unbelievable actor. Um, yeah, lots and lots of people who you kind of get inspired by, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so bit of a, bit of a tangent here. Uh, yeah. But so. As an actor, I think one of, one of the things I envy about actors and just a lot of creatives in general is the the kind of travel aspect. So, yeah. you, didn't you shoot Last Kingdom in Budapest? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, my question I had was, what what was that experience like? Because I'm assuming you didn't you you'd had no previous contact with the the cast, so that must have yeah. been really scary. What was that yeah. like? I mean, weirdly, weirdly, actually, when you when it kind of comes full circle, really, when you talk about people I'd admired, I was a bit of a fan of David Dawson, who played Alfred, because oh, right. he'd been, I'd been to see him in a couple of plays, 
And actually he'd been to see me in a couple of plays because we both were aware of each other's work because we were working mm. in London theatre at the same kind of time. Mm. Um, so he was one of the very few people who I knew at least to say hello to because I think I'd met him once in a bar. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the brilliant thing about working away and traveling is I didn't go to uni, I didn't do a gap year. At, at 17, I left school and I started working the police federation, like the big headquarters of the, like the police union is near where I grew up. So I got a job like doing waitering there, like yeah. straight away when I left school. And then I became, and then I, and then acting happened. Like acting happened within like six months of leaving school. Yeah. So uh, I never, I never went like, I never did Thailand and the Inca Trail and the Gold yeah. Coast. You know what I mean? Like I didn't yeah. do those things. And so I'd never really been anywhere. Um, and I didn't really have a kind of family where we could go on holiday, you know, lots and lots. We, we, we didn't have money like that. So when you kind of go, I mean, we, we were back and forth to Budapest, but by and large, I was there for a year, pretty much just there for a year and a half over the course of about three or four years. You're there for about six months when you're shooting. Right. And sometimes you, you don't go home for a couple of months. Sometimes you don't go home for a couple of weeks, whatever it might be. But the one, it's amazing to see other countries and to see other, yeah. other things. And I know Budapest probably better than I know any city apart from London by this point, you know. Oh, wow. and, I, and I really, lo really, really loved it there. And I really tried to learn the language, which is really hard, but I tried. Um, <laughs> and when you're there, you're cast. I mean, some of the best, some of my best friends are Last Kingdom cast, because when you've, when you've had that sort of experience that takes you away from everyone takes you so far from everybody. You yeah. can only rely on each other. It's not like you're in America where you could walk into a bar and just get chatting with people or in Canada. You're, mm -hmm. you're, people don't speak, people don't really speak English. And so you go to work with these people, you go out every night and then you come back to the apartment complex where you're all living and then you go to bed and then you get up in the next morning. Um, so I had a brilliant, you know, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant to be able to do that. And then I, the, the other kind of little bits of travel I've done, I've done a little bit of travel promoting a film, went to like San Francisco and Munich and places like that. And then I did a play. I did a play in India, um, which was really, really cool. To ba went to Bangalore in India and was there for, I can't remember how long I was there, three or four weeks. But that was that was amazing. Whenever you get opportunities to do that, it's, you're, re you're really, really grateful for it. It is brilliant. Yeah. So uh, would you say it kind of makes it easier because I imagine it's the same uh, it's the same experience for a lot of the cast, like they don't know anyone. So you kind of said yeah. how like, you kind of rely on each other to get through it and you kind of build up friendships through that. That's exactly what it is. It's really unifying. Yeah. You know, you're, you're all, um, you're, you, you're all in it together. And we were lucky as well that we didn't have, I think it would be very different if you had really big egos in the cast, but we don't really, we never really had that. You know, we never had people who didn't want to mix, didn't want to have dinner, didn't want to share a car. We didn't have those people. And so you're kind of, yeah, you, you become a, you become a, a surrogate family for each other, really. Yeah. Well, yeah, cause that, that kind of touches on my next question. So I was going to say, what it, what was it kind of like that whole experience? I know you've answered quite a lot of that already, but um, were there any like quite strong relationships you built up with any of the cast that you like really good friends now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, def definitely. Like we, you know, I was getting married. Went to, we, we got married last year, my wife and I. But we were going to be having a, a big wedding. We ended up just doing a little legal bit, and we're going to hopefully have a celebration this summer. And there's like, I don't know, there's like eight, ten people from the Last Kingdom coming. I'm getting. <laughs> We're getting, we're getting uh, our, the person who's marrying us, not legally, but the person who's marrying us is James Northcote, who played Aldhelm. Um, I, I married him and his wife. Um, um, Ian, who plays Father Bioka, helped me organize my proposal. Um, oh, wow. You know, like, yeah. And, and we, look after, we look after Millie Brady's dog when she's shooting, when she plays Apple <laughs> Fleb. Um, yeah, like I, I work, I work with Mark now because Mark set up this um, online drama school called the Actors Community, uh, and right. I teach for them. So Mark is like my boss now. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, like there's 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 a lot. There are a lot of people in that cast who who were really really important to me, really special. So yeah, we were very very lucky, very lucky. Because yeah. I, I did see, um, you know, there's like a day in the life of um, videos on YouTube. 
So yeah. you, you all do seem like a family. Like uh, I know it's like you and Eliza were like kind of like taking the mick out of each other. You're almost like siblings, which is really nice yeah. to see. Um, there are two reactions people have to that video. <laughs> people are like they're like siblings, or they were like they're definitely dating. And we both thought that was so funny because as much as we're very good friends, the idea that we would be dating, given that I've been in a relationship for ten years, <laughs> it's kind of mad. But yeah, 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 yeah it's a lovely, lovely group. Yeah, it sounds it. Um, so when you were portraying Ethelwald, mm. did you, were you kind of given a direction of how to play him or did you kind of get to put your own spin on it? Well, when you, when you get, when you get the material, you get the casting brief, just like a little breakdown, which, which breaks the, you know, kind of gives you a little two, three, four sentence summary of the character. Yeah. I can't remember what Ethelwald was, but when you first auditioned for the show, you had to audition for either um, Alfred or Uhtred. I think they were just sort of seeing, they just wanted to see people read as one of these characters, because obviously yeah. they were the sort of big polar opposites in the show. Yeah. And then they'd filter you down into what they thought you were right for. And I got a call from my agent, and I don't know whether my agent was was telling me the truth or telling me a lie and just trying to motivate me, but we were made for a really long time and she knows how to push my buttons in a, in a really good way. So she said, um, got this audition for you and they don't think you can do it. I was like, what? She was uh, like, they, they, they don't think you can do it. They just, they think you're just a comedy actor because I'd played, I'd, I'd been cast by the same casting director as a, in a comedy called Episodes. Um, and they were like, they're not sure you can do it, but you know, I said, I think you can. So I was like, oh, I'll oh, show them. So <laughs> I was auditioning for, I auditioned for Alfred and it, I can't remember what the scene was. It was one in the writing room where um, he's saying, he's talking to Uhtred and Breeder and he's like, and one king, if all men are agreed, yes, one king, yeah. like a single kingdom called England and all this sort of stuff. And I knew I wasn't really right for it, but I thought I'm gonna have a fucking good go here. So <laughs> I really, really worked proper, proper hard at it. Probably the hardest I'd ever worked on a script. And I went in and I met the casting assistant or casting associate and I taped and they were like, oh, that, thank, thanks, that was really good. Um, and I kind of knew it had gone well. And then I got a phone call saying, they don't think you're right for that, but here's a character. And they sent me Ethelwald. They sent me the brief and they sent me the scenes which were, one of them was like, it's the one that's where my father's just died and I tried to pretend that he actually wanted me to be king and he just named me as heir to the yeah. throne. Um, and maybe there was another one, but I remember, oh yes, and it was the one where, I think it was the one where um, I'm a bit drunk and saying he was caught humping a nun once, Alfred. I'm with Uhtred and Leofrich, and I'm kind <laughs> of going, oh, God won't let him kill me, I like God. And I remember reading it and going, and, and you, you have these feelings as an actor, and sometimes they're wrong and sometimes they're right, but you have this instinctive reaction where I was just like, oh, I'm gonna get that, that, that that's yeah. my character. I'll, I'll do that and I, and and I felt just felt like he fitted me or I fit him you know I felt like I kind of wore him very easily and kind of got it and you know also completely sympathized with him like no everyone no one will convince me that he isn't the hero of the show like I think <laughs> he's totally totally justified in everything he does and I think that's a really important thing as an actor as well that you never judge your characters from the outside because it does, yeah. does, yeah. does no one any good if I'm going, oh, he's a bit of a cock, but I'll have a go. Like, I've got to believe that he's right. Um, and and yeah, so I remember, get, I remember getting that and being like, oh yeah, this is a bit of me, this. Yeah, you did, I mean, you did play him really well. I think when, yeah. I, when I first watched it, from, from like that immediate like reaction of first seeing you, I, I assumed you were gonna be uh, a bit like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you turned out to be a lot more complex than that. Like you became yeah. very cunning and, and I wise. Think, like for, I think it, yeah. at his, at he was, he was, he kind of, he almost became Tyrion for a little while. Yeah. Very close to becoming Tyrion. And then I don't know who he became towards the end. <laughs> Just a bit of a dickhead. But I, but I kind of, yeah, I'm, I, I also remember, you know, remember saying to my wife, um, he could be really, really exciting. Like, there's so, you can really go somewhere with him. Yeah. And I think in the first series, I was lucky that I was one of the people who really had a journey, whose characters really had a journey to go on, um, that he really changed. You know, he went from being this kind of bratty, slightly pathetic, 
and then then you kind of think start to feel a little bit of sympathy for him and you kind of like him and he kind of he's becoming a little bit of a sort of lovable idiot and then he and then he suddenly and then you I, I hope you start to take him more seriously and the whole point I remember reading series three and reading the killing of Ragnar and I didn't know that I was going to do that until oh, I read the script I had no idea and I remember reading it and and being like oh in a minute someone's going to come in and catch him and yeah. you know and then you turn the next page and the next page and the next page and you go oh my god he did it and I hope as an audience you have that same experience of being like he's not going to do it he's not going to do it he's not going to do it oh he did and then I think that's when I lose an audience and I think in a really good way a way that I was really pleased about when people were just angry at him really because I think and I think people I think the reason people were angry is because they started to like him and started to sympathize with him and then yeah. he goes and does something like that and everyone feels somehow responsible yeah <laughs> I mean, it, it was a cool journey for him, but he kind of, like you said, he went from kind of like maybe a bit pathetic, very drunk all the time, to yeah. very like cunning and smart. And then towards the end, I think after he'd killed Ragnar especially, he became very, quite like desperate to just yeah. get in with someone to yeah. keep him safe. Yeah, um, it's like, like, yeah, it was like any port in a storm. It was just like anyone who can give me a, give, who yeah. can help me <laughs> with my sake. Yeah. Um, well, that's kind of, leading on to my next question as well because I was going to say so when you found out your character was going to die what was your reaction to that well I read the books you see so as soon as we got as soon as I could as soon as I found out I got the job I bought the first six books which is up to a book called the death of kings and there are two kings who die in that book there's Alfred and then there's Ethelwald uh, oh, right. And and so I was like, all oh, right, okay. Well, if they in that case, if they go two books a series, I die at the end of season three. But I had signed a four-year deal, so even at the beginning of four, I was kind of at the beginning of three. Sorry, I remember having conversations with producers and execs, and them kind of going and saying to them, "Is he going to die?" Because that you start without the full script being written, which I think a lot of people don't yeah. realise. I never read, I never sat down and read scripts one to eight or one to 10 ever, ever. Oh, right. At best you had four scripts when you started a series and you yeah. might not even have an arc beyond that. So you don't know, like, especially cause it's a show with such a high turnaround. When new scripts came out, like you'd give it a couple of hours and the WhatsApp would be like firing off. Cause everyone would be like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm, not dead, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> and, and so they were kind of, they were toying at one point with were they going to keep me around? Was I going to escape at the end of three and then be like a, a, something again in four? And I think they they made the decision that, you know, it was, they just wanted to give it a really clean end. And actually, I think f from an ego point of view, there is something quite nice about being like the main death at the end of the series, about sort of being, <laughs> Like you, you are kind of like oh, not that in any way the series was about my death because it was really it was about the end of Alfred. But those last two eps, I'm sort of the bad guy. I mean, so's so's Knut and so's yeah. Eston. Um, but you know, I'm kind of. I, I I felt like the character got a really great send off. The scene between Uhtred and Ethelwald, I think, is a really good scene. Um, the way in which they, there was nowhere more, there was nowhere you could go with him. I mean, he's got one. Yeah. How, how, also, how many more days was I going to have to have a three hour makeup call to have a prosthetic eye put on? Like, <laughs> I was bloody miserable by the end. <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah, did that, did that like take a while having the. I, hate, I hated it, man. I hated it. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you, what you do is you, um, they tape your eyes shut. Right. Uh, and then they, put a prosthetic over the top and then they paint the prosthetic. I mean, I had a um, a makeup artist called um, Judith Horniak, who I always have to think about her name because we called her LJ. We called her Little Judith for like three years because there were two Judiths and she was the shortest one. Brilliant, brilliant Hungarian makeup artist who uh, we just like got on so, so well. And she was amazing and, and very patient with me because I'm not very good in the mornings. Um, 
But yeah, it would take two to three hours, my makeup in the morning once I had the once I had the prosthetic on. And the bad thing would be if you were doing battles and stuff, because obviously you're even though your your eye is shut, it's still moving every time the other one moves. Yeah. And so gradually it starts to weep. And if it weeps, it takes the tape off and then your eyes open under the prosthetic and it's like rubbing against the inside of the prosthetic. And I think the longest I had it on for, I had it on for 13 hours one day. And that was like, you take it off in the trailer and they're like, keep your eyes shut, keep your eyes shut, keep your eyes shut. Because you like, everything starts to like, your eyes trying to figure out how to focus and everything's a bit blurry and you can get really dizzy. Like it's a, it's a, it's not something I'd ever particularly want to do again, but it was such a brilliant turning point, such a brilliant chapter for the character to be like, he has changed and you can't go back from where he's been now. And it's a great sort of physical indicator for an audience as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna try and move off the last kingdom of it because I've been sure, asking dude, you dude, loads dude. of questions. <laughs> Ever. Um, and I was gonna say, so uh, you were recently in Assassin's Creed as a voiceover character. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, how did that role come about? That was an interesting one, actually, because I got the, some of that work through my voice agent. So I had an audition for a game called, I can't remember what the working title was, but it wasn't Assassin's Creed because you, you don't know oh, what right. it is. You yeah. have no idea that you're working on Assassin's Creed because they don't tell you because they there are so many people involved in that production that they don't want to risk someone actually accidentally being like, oh, I'm in Assassin's Creed. So. Yeah. You have to, um, you have to keep it. You 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 go you go to the studios and they've got this kind of concept art up on the wall, and you're like, oh, I think I I think I might know what this is. I think I might know what this is. And anyway, I was doing a load of incidental voices. So, for example, if you go to when you f I only know this because I've just started playing the game. When you right. first get off your boat, um, with the first time you go to England, the very first time you get off the boat, there's a yeah. group of there's a group of English people who are like waiting on the near the dock, and you have a fight with them. And one of them's like, "We don't take kindly to sack to Viking scum," and that's me. So I was in there <laughs> to do like little voices like that. Oh, and then right. I got people from my voice agent being like, um, "They've got this character, and they'd like you to play it." So they sent me over all this stuff, and it had been going quite well. So I thought they were just offering me another part because I've been doing quite well. Cause you, I mean, I'd already played like five, you know, four, five, six little roles, you know, yeah. like changing your accent, changing your delivery, changing your pitch, all this sort of stuff that you do as a voice mm -hmm. actor. And um, I was reading this breakdown for this character called Hunwald. And I said to my wife, really fucking sounds like Ethelwald this. Like, <laughs> sounds like a really nice version of Ethelwald. And then I get to the, the bottom and at the bottom it said reference, Ethelwald from the last kingdom, but without the edge. And what oh, had happened wow. was the writers had written, had seen The Last Kingdom, amongst many other things, had written this character with this thing in mind, gave it to the casting department who were like, right, let's see who we've got. And someone clearly went, we've got the guy who played Ethelwald. Do you think you'd want to do it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, it kind of came about in a, in a bit of an odd way, but I had a brilliant, brilliant time doing that. Absolutely brilliant. I loved it so much. It was my first computer game I'd ever done. Um, I'd love oh, wow. to do more. It's that they're, they're amazing. That's such. It's a. It's much. It's kind of very freeing in one way because all you've got to worry about is how you sound. But it's also massively technical and really challenging. It's a. It's brilliant. I loved it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, hopefully you get to do more because you are really good in it. I think it was really cool how they got. They got everyone from like. Yeah. Last Kingdom Vikings, Vikings. Norsemen. Yeah. yeah. So it was just. It was really nice like seeing all these different voices pop up. Well, let's, uh, so I'm, like, let's put that. I'm playing entirely as the male Ivor, uh, Eivor because yeah. I want to play as Magnus. Because yeah. like, <laughs> the first, so like the first thing I did in England was I recognised my own voice, and me as Magnus ran at me and killed me because I was like, I get to kill myself. I get to kill myself. <laughs> yeah, that must be a weird experience. Yeah, weird experience. Um, so moving on from that now, uh, you've also done quite a lot of theatre. Um, yeah. How does that? compare to acting for TV or film? Well, I think I think the principles behind how you how you break down a script and how you create a character and how you work on it are exactly the same. Or almost exactly the same. Where it where it becomes very different is the technicalities of how in of how you translate that. So it's like, you know the cat the, the fire at the center of a character 
is just as hot for theatre and for st and for screen. But with theatre, you've just got to be able to see it for a little bit further away. You've got to be able to see it from the back of the theatre. Whereas when you've got a camera here, you have to do you maybe have to do less. But the same thoughts, the same emotional, psychological kind of understanding, the same processes. Um, theatre was kind of what theatre was my first thing. Still, the best moments I have ever had in my career are on stage. They're not on screen because on screen you're kind of there's someone here holding a boom, and you've been up since five or four, and you know you've got to do it another eight times, and you've just had lunch, so you're kind of a bit sleepy. Do you know what I mean? Like there's all these other, yeah. and, you, and you're not really looking at the person. The person's over here, but you've got to look over here because that will make the eye line look right, and you have to make sure you're not kind of doing this all the time and pretend that the person who's delivering you the yeah. love, you know. So it's much more technical, but yeah, theatre was my. Theatre is like the the biggest rush I ever got. The sort of purest experience I ever had was when I was doing theatre. Mm. Um, but I was I was really lucky, you know. Like from by, by and large, I got to do both, and that was amazing, you know, because I, I, there aren't that many actors who get to do both. I was really fortunate. I was just in the right place at the right time, a lot of the time. Yeah, that kind of, and I could do a bit of everything. So would you say with the theatre it's kind of more it's more engaging because you don't have to focus on any technicalities, it's just the raw emotion of your character? Well, to an extent, to an extent that's exactly what it is. Although there is a huge amount of technicality to it in terms of you've got to be able to maintain it over a four week run. So if you burn out in oh, yeah. and you're like <gasps> then you then you can't do it, then you've sort of ruined it. But what you do get in theatre is you start every Day at the beginning and you finish at the end and so you have an incredible understanding of the trajectory of a character and you have an incredible understanding of um, the arc whereas yep. on screen you're kind of going sometimes you go to the continuity supervisor the person who kind of script supervisor sorry the person who looks after all the technical all the story stuff and you'll be like where have I just been because and they'll be like, oh, well, you you remember four weeks ago we were shooting that scene, you just walked out that door. Like, right, okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not, it's harder to, to, uh, it can be harder to um, place everything. But actually yeah. with screen, with screen, once you've done it once, or once you've spent a day doing it, you never have to revisit it again. So you can burn yourself out a lot more. You can really, really, really go for it because you know you don't have to do it 60 times over the course of four weeks or whatever yeah. it was weeks you just have to do it maybe 10 times today five of which is going to be your coverage and then the rest mm -hmm. of it you can you know you'll be all right like you've got tomorrow off or whatever yeah so it sounds like there's kind of pros and cons to both really yeah, definitely yeah definitely. um so have you ever had as an actor any difficulties working with certain people obviously that, if that's the case you don't have to name who and if so, how do you kind of deal with that? Uh, have I ever, have I ever worked with anyone who's really difficult? Not really, like I'm probably difficult. You know, like I, I'm, I'm probably difficult. I don't mean to be, but you know, there are days, <laughs> there, there will be days in, an, in a year and a half of The Last Kingdom. I hope they won't be more than three or four days where I would have turned up just with a bit of a cob on and the vast majority of people will do that and I think there, there is, there's a difference. There's a difference between people who are negligent, which is I think at worst what I can be, which is where I'm tired or I'm stressed or whatever, and, and yeah. everyone goes through that. And then there are malicious people who are trying to walk through the back of your shot so they get their own single, they're trying to take the strongest place on the stage, they're trying to compete with you on mm. during a play. And those people are very very rare and yeah. very often quite unhappy people so just let them get on with it i mean th there've never been there have never been times where i have seen it, i think it, if you're talking about real monsters you know people with terrible <laughs> reputations i haven't worked with them you know yeah. or, um but if i saw you know if i saw someone being you know, uh, 
violent or abusive to someone, of course, you, at that point, you step in and say something. But yeah. but no, while, 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 you know, in my career, the most you really have to compete with is sort of knowing that someone's trying to s steal a scene a little bit. And at that point, you just trust your own work and believe mm -hmm. that these things even themselves out in the end. Yeah. OK. Um, has COVID affected your work recently, these past couple of years? Have you been yeah. struggling? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, I've shot a little bit, you know, but um, but a lot of, you know, to be honest, a lot, my, my, my work has been slow since I finished Last Kingdom, to be honest. Like I haven't, right. you haven't really worked that much. Uh, and that has been at times really, really tricky. Uh, and really disappointing, but at other times, kind of absolutely fine. Because when the whole world shuts down, you kind of don't feel like um, yeah. you don't feel that odd. But I have, I'm lucky that I have other acting-related stuff that I do. So I do a lot of voice work, and the voice work has all kept happening, and it's happened remotely. Um, That's good. So uh, I went, I went back into town to do Assassin's Creed a couple of times. Um, and a couple of other little projects. And then the majority of my stuff, I can record from a wardrobe with a big professional mic set up. And uh -huh. you, I've been I've been doing um, dubbing on, on TV shows so that like Netflix has bought a load of foreign language stuff and they need act English actors to revoice it in English. Um, okay. So I did, I did a, sh a show called um, How to Sell Drugs Online Fast, which is about um, these, it's based on a sort of true story about these two high school kids in Germany who started an online MDMA business. Um, and I did that and I did a big sort of French revolution and zombie vampire thing. And you do it all oh, from wow. home. Like it's mad, you do it You do it all from home. And, and, and from that point of view, it's been, it's actually been really, it's been quite lovely. And um, I've been teaching as well. I've started teaching through Mark's platform. Yeah. Um, and that's all happened from home. So I've worked less, but I think I've probably been much more content in the last year than I, than I have been in a while, actually. Despite, you know, obviously that's, there's, there's awful things happening and there's people dying. And I, I don't mean in any way to diminish that, but on a personal level, in regards to your actual question, from a mental health point of view, it's kind of been better, you know, because yeah. you can kind of understand why things aren't happening for you. Whereas other times you, you're just sort of waiting for the phone to ring, thinking, I'm not really sure what I've done wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's been, I think it's been tough for everyone, but everyone's had different experiences. Like you, you do see a lot of people who are like, who are glad that they, they've managed to get some things done during lockdown. So yeah, it has been, it has been different. Um, do you have any plans for the future or any upcoming roles uh, that um, you're quite excited about? Nothing I can talk about. Um, nothing I can talk about, but only little bits and bobs. I mean, as you get, as I've got older, I'm less, I am less um, bothered about what other people think really. And I think that as, as an actor, you spend an awful lot of time trying to second, trying to second guess other people's reactions, trying to figure out what will make you work, what will stop you from working, what you should do, who you should see, who should you be following on Twitter, who should you be following on Instagram, what photo, what stuff should you be putting out on social media. Yeah. And it's all about kind of external validation. It's all about kind of going, if this person says I'm good and I'm worth something, then I'm worth something. And that's great when they're telling you you're worth something. But as soon as they start telling you something different, it's very easy to believe that you're worth absolutely nothing. Yeah. And so, you know, over the past few years, I've been, I've just got to a point where I'm more interested in what I think about what I'm doing. Um, and I'm doing stuff I like. I'm doing stuff that I'm happy with. I've got lovely friends. Yeah. Like I've got, we've got an, I live somewhere where I love living and the work, work is work. And that's a new thing for me. That's a kind of, last couple of years thing work is work um so there's stuff that i'm delighted to be in um and there's stuff that i'm kind of 
excited to see, but it's not the biggest thing in my life like it used to be when yeah. I first started. And that's not to say in any way that I'm not grateful for everything that I've done, Last Kingdom in particular. Um, but yeah, yeah, nothing I can, nothing I can bring to mind that I can talk about because these days everything's under yeah. non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. But, um, yeah, little bits and bobs. If you keep an eagle eye out, I'll be in something at some point. Okay, I'll look after. I mean, I, um, it's it's good that you've got that kind of like attitude about, um, you know, like that kind of self-reliance, that self-positivity, uh, mm. not relax. I think I know I struggle with that, and I think a lot of people do. So it's, yeah. it's good that you managed to find that. Um, I think that's it. That's uh, all my questions. So, yeah. Thank you so, so much for doing this. It's been great. Okay.